Yeah, well, the topics of sexuality and theology, well, never the twain shall meet. They just weren't talked about in the same sentence. Well, not so the work of our next guest. Jay Johnson, the author of Peculiar Faith, Queer Theology for Christian Witness, and another book, Divine Communion, a Eucharistic Theology of Sexual Intimacy. Jay, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Sex and religion. Sex and religion. So, yes, it's a huge topic. Um, certainly something that's been a, a big part of my own life, uh, mm -hmm. coming out at a private Christian college when I was a senior there years ago, um, and then really delving into the scholarship, the biblical aspects of it, all of those things over the years. And over the last 15 years, really devoting a lot of time to what you might call spiritual activism, really mm -hmm. trying to get faith communities on board with LGBT inclusion. Right. That's the sort of short story of well, that. Well, let's go back a little bit. You talk about that time when you were in college and your coming out experience as a yeah. person of faith. Where was that and what was it like? Right. So uh, I'm a graduate of Wheaton College. If that sounds familiar, that's been in the Hobby Lobby yes. news recently yes. about the Supreme Court. So I came out there, uh, as I said, when I was a senior uh, with a really good friend of mine. And we realized at that moment that, like so many others, we were faced with a choice. Do we continue to live as Christians and have mm -hmm. that faith? position, or do we embrace our sexual identities? And I guess the two of us were stubborn enough, we just decided not to choose. And we were convinced there's got to be a way that these can be integrated. And I think that an important uh, piece of that journey is doing the kind of biblical homework that so many people have done over the years. I would call that the apologetic task, you know, how do we justify our existence uh -huh. in Christian churches? And more recently, though, David, the uh, thing that's really my passion is what I would call the constructive task. What do LGBT people actually contribute constructively, proactively to Christian faith, to churches, to the ongoing development of theological ideas? Right. And, I mean, yeah. you know, I, I would think for a good part of your life and career, you've been beaten up by both sides of the equation. I mean, I'm sure there are some Christians who said you can't be gay and certainly sexually active if you're Christian. Right. And I'm quite sure there were a number oh, of people yes. in the LGBT community that said, you know what, I have no use for the church. That's right. Small C or big C? That's right. No, exactly. Um, I often say, especially here in the Bay Area, it's more difficult to come out as Christian in <laughs> LGBT circles right, than the other way around. And I totally understand that. You know, I think it's very fair to say that um, religion has been the primary obstacle and roadblock to the full equality and inclusion of LGBT people in this country and other places. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be, though. That's what I have been working on and many of my colleagues for a good number of years, to really reverse that tide mm -hmm. and not only to preach uh, a, a message of inclusion, but also of contribution. Uh, and actually how the church needs LGBT people and our insights. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that. I mean, this is completely anecdotal, apocryphal information, but I remember when I was the best little boy in the world, altar boy, <laughs> in uh, Catholic school and Catholic right. church in Richmond, right. Virginia, hearing even then, back in the 1970s, that 60 percent of the Roman Catholic clergy were gay. Right. I mean, do you think that is a widely exaggerated figure? It is obviously really difficult to know, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, I, I don't think it's wildly exaggerated. It's mm -hmm. probably a bit high, but mm -hmm. I think the percentage is a lot higher than 10%, right. obviously. Well, so then to get to your point, if indeed the percentage of uh, LGBT community members within, quote unquote, the church, whether it's right. Catholic, Episcopalian, what have you, right. is larger than the average, yes. 10%. How do you go about the research you're doing? How do you right. go about not only saying that Christianity is not antithetical to being gay, but actually right. we as gay people help make the church better yes. or help make spiritual lives better? Exactly. How you do know, you prove some, it? Well, how do you prove it? That's a really good question. There's very little you can prove in religion, right? But <laughs> um, the, uh, there have, some scholars have suggested, actually, that over time in different cultures, historical periods, that people we today would call L 
LG B or T mm -hmm. actually played a very significant spiritual role in the life of a community that something about those sensibilities our relationships offer something uh, unique and distinctive to mm -hmm. the to faith to religion um, I think uh, just one example um, today from Christian churches is you know for since the what the 1960s 1970s um, Christian churches have been trying to figure out what to do with gay and lesbian people do we accept mm -hmm. them, do we not, making ethical decisions about us um, without actually reflecting on their own sexuality. So they've been asked to make difficult decisions without really having the tools to think about their own lives. One of the great gifts I think that we as LGBT people bring is a history of reflecting very deliberately, intentionally on sexual intimacy mm -hmm. and our relationships, the kinds of families that we form. and. Uh, what that has to offer to the meaning of faith community, spiritual practice, social change. Um, so that's that's where I get excited about that kind of research. Now, the first time you went into, whether it was your, your dean or your teacher <laughs> or whomever it was, and said, I want to work on issues of sexual intimacy mm, yes. and theology, what was the response? Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was really great. So, uh, one Oh, of you're the, serious. I'm very serious. So one of the things that uh, th I feel blessed about in my life is where I get to work, Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, California. Um, since 2003, I've been there, and since that year as well, the school has offered something called a Certificate of Sexuality and Religion. So a so specialized... That's got to be unique or almost oh, it is. unique. Yes. There aren't very many places where you can actually have that kind of specialized study mm -hmm. in a seminary, right? Pacific School of Religion is a school of theology and seminary, and a long history, almost 150 years of really progressive religious mm -hmm. and theological education. So I've gotten to, to develop courses and uh, actually do workshops around the country and write these books and take time to think about these topics in a really deliberate way. Mm -hmm. And I've really enjoyed it and I think it actually does make a contribution to the wider society. Now you are uh, an Episcopal priest, yes. correct? Mm -hmm. Your work, though, spans all Christian faiths, or also is—is uh, is it interfaith? Uh, is right. some of your research based in other spiritual traditions? I mean, I—I I remember years ago reading a fascinating book on Native American spiritual yes, practice right. about the burdash, yes. what we would now probably call gender neutral or gender indifferent right. uh, people. We would call them gay priests, maybe. Yes, right. So. Um, my own area of research and writing and teaching is within Christian traditions, mm -hmm. not just Anglican or Episcopal, more broadly Christian traditions. What's really great about the Graduate Theological Union, though, uh, is that it is a multi-faith, inter-religious kind of consortium. So in addition to a Center for Jewish Studies and Islamic mm -hmm. Studies uh, and Buddhist Studies, we're going to be welcoming uh, Hindus and Sikhs and others uh, in the in the upcoming years for a really vibrant interfaith, interreligious conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm hopeful that, you know, not every religious tradition knows exactly how to deal with some of these sexuality issues, and I'm hopeful that that kind of context can really spark right. those conversations. You know, by its very nature, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, religion is hierarchical. Mm. At least most religions, mm. Western religions. Mm. Um, which of the religions is quote unquote best? and which is worst as far as LGBT issues? Oh, wow, that's a really great question. So, um, And you tell me if you think it's a fair question. Yeah, it's, ha it's hard to, s to answer in one respect because uh, the question needs to be asked better in what respect. So in the United States, for example, which has from its founding uh, a primarily a Christian population, mm -hmm. the issues around sexuality have focused mostly there mm -hmm. um, with uh, also a good deal in Judaism. Other countries have not had the same kind of conversation at the secular level around sexuality where some of those religious traditions may have also engaged in that. So the, the civil discourse and the religious discourse, how those two come together often makes a big difference on how religions deal with mm -hmm. these questions. So um, I, I don't want to get myself in trouble by ranking these religious traditions. All right, but, no, you know, I, I understand. Um, I think uh, 
But I mean, we, I mean, Christians aren't stoning gay people anymore. I mean, there are religions that are. Or would you say that's the religion, or would you say that's something else? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, let's also remember that things are different in other parts of the world. So, mm -hmm. um, in parts of Africa right now, where there's been some horrible legislation mm -hmm. introduced and signed and enacted that actually makes homosexuality a capital crime, that those efforts have been led often by religious leaders. Which How does is, that make you feel? Uh, angry, sad, mm -hmm. and even more committed to doing this kind of work because mm -hmm. there's no reason that that has to be uh, religiously based. All right. You know, a mutual friend of ours, the, the late Bishop Otis Charles, yes. was very yes. fond of a phrase that we said many times around the dinner table, and, you know, it's an answer to the question, what do you think of Christianity, to which Otis would reply, I think maybe, you know, we should try it. We should try um, it, exactly. <laughs> what would, not only what would Jesus say, but you're a biblical scholar. What did Jesus say about homosexuality? Well, the huge question uh, with a simple answer, he said nothing. So the word homosexuality was invented, as you likely know, in the late 19th mm -hmm. century. So the way that we think about it in the modern West would be very strange uh, to first century people. Um, so there, there are are ways to do that biblical research and historical research that take into account those deep cultural differences. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really clear to me, though, in so many of the things that Jesus is reported to have said in the gospel texts, the message is love. Mm -hmm. You know, the message is not hate, it's not exclusion, it's not condemnation. It's about how we love each other. That is the message he brought and the message that Christianity has a chance to retrieve again. Mm -hmm. Now, the Pacific School of Religion is an Episcopal seminary. No, actually it's not. So it's interdenominational. Ah. There's an Episcopal Seminary part of the uh -huh. consortium there. So that would be Church Divinity School of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. PSR is uh, interdenominational, um, and that includes, interestingly, neo-pagans and some other mm -hmm. traditions outside of mainstream Christianity. So it's a fascinating community to do this work in. Yeah. Do you think <laughs> this could exist outside of the People's Republic of Berkeley? <laughs> It's, uh, I often think no. Uh, uh -huh. There's something unique about Bay Area culture, uh, and Berkeley in particular maybe, that um, really fosters these kinds of conversations. I'm happy to say though that there are places around the country, other parts where these conversations are happening in some new ways in Chicago and New York and some other places. Right. That's really helpful. In, in our last few moments, talk to me about, you know, I mean, a, a big picture question. Yeah. Where do you see your work going, not just within um, the world of the Pacific School of Religion, yeah. or not even just the Christian world. Where do you see books like this, talking about a Eucharistic theology of sexual intimacy? Yeah. It's a great title. Yeah. Where do you see this work leading? Can your work help people of faith who are Sikh, Hindu, yeah, yeah. Islam, uh, Islamic, or yeah. Jewish? Yes. Yeah. So, another really great question. Here's um, a short answer to that. Uh, I think it's really important that sexuality issues not be isolated uh, in their own little silo, but deeply connected to race, to economics, to the environment. There are some really important connections among all of these. In, the two, in these two books of mine, I try to make some of those connections in at least a preliminary way. I'm really excited about pushing that out even farther race, economics, uh, the environment, and sexuality all together. Well, as, as, as someone else once said, you know, God is everywhere. Sometimes you can even find him in church. That's Sound, right. Sounds like you can find him at the Pacific <laughs> School of Religion. Thanks for talking with us. Thank you, Hope David. you'll come back. Thanks. Next up, our conversation with author Brent Sverdloff telling us how to remember names. Hope he comes on quick. We'll be right back.